we're it's back in the lab. Too, we're back in the lab with another episode, and today <laughs> we're delving into the realms of professional football and the world of football and how that can prepare you for the world of business, raising funds, recruiting, managing a team, managing different projects, building something that adds value beyond football. So today we've got my guy Sam Holden. He's going to talk about his journey from, you know, being at Manchester United, one of the biggest clubs in the world. In the world. (laughs) And then building one of the apps that's going to really take the world of sports psychology to the next level in football. Sam Holden, welcome to the Beyond Football podcast. Thank you for having me, boys. It's a pleasure. Yeah, that's it, man. And we always love to go to the start, go to the source. You know, I was listening to the diary of a CEO today and he, he spoke, he always speaks about our ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and they shape the rest of your life. What are some of, if you will, some of your ACEs that have shaped who you've become today? Wow. I think there's some football specific ones for sure that we can probably all relate to. Yeah. And then you get the ones in the personal life as well and they're intertwined as you grow up because that's your formative years, right? Mm. So I think a big one for me starting off was moving from the north to the south. <laughs> I, I don't sound like it, but I was born in Yorkshire. Oh, really? I had a little Where Halifax, Yorkshire no accent. Were you born in Halifax? Yeah. I used Halifax. to play for them, to be fair. Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew that from the my shame. research. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. I, hey, yo, I you might no be research. lying about the it. <laughs> the shaman. The yeah. shaman. I was once a shaman. Yeah, so yeah. I, I was born really, really close to the Shea. To the Shea, yeah. Yeah, Halifax wow. General Hospital. And I grew up there for five years. Yeah. My mum's family are from Yorkshire. My dad's from Lancashire. So War of Roses family. Yeah. We moved down to Bristol when I was five. Wow. Um... And moving to a place that's got a thick accent, that <laughs> most people know the Bristol accent, yeah, right? with a little Yorkshire accent. Um, it was tough, actually. I won't mm-hmm. lie. Like taking the mick out of my accent at five <laughs> year, five years old to the point where I was like, do you know what? I don't really want a Bristolian accent, but I can't get by with this Yorkshire one. At five years old. At five years old. Wow. Way. Um, and it was it was quite, that was that was quite formative. Yeah. But I moved down, having played rugby league and football from a young age, like three mm-hmm. four years old. And I had a massive passion for both. And that really helped me to assimilate with new people, yeah. playing football with them. And I think we'll, we'll probably touch on it today, yeah. but the social skills that you learn playing football helped me even at five years old to, yeah, to start making friends. Um, that's probably the first ACE. The second one was at 13, I was with Bristol Rose from the age of eight in their academy, mm. doing quite well actually. Um, when I was 13, I had meningoencephalitis, okay. which is encephalitis, swelling of the meninges, but also swelling of the brain. And the way that it presented for me was like a stroke. So I was out oh. in the garden playing with my brothers and cousins, playing football. It was a family reunion on Mother's Day. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't work my legs. I started losing control of the left-hand side of my body to the point where I had to crawl myself from the garden into the kitchen all the family think I'm taking the mick. Yeah. Uh, I'm crying, I can't speak. Mm. And then I blacked out, woke up in hospital. I did loads of tests, meningoencephalitis, was in hospital for about six weeks. This is the back end of the football season as well, so it's contract time. Renewals when you're in academies. Um, but Bristol Rovers were really good with me at that point. They said, that, take your time, recover. The doctors and the football physio weren't really sure how I'd recover because it affects the brain as well as the body and the development, focus, concentration, all of these things. And I really struggled going back to school. I was unfit from football, couldn't run probably even 100, 200 meters without gassing out. And I built back up to getting back into training and playing over the next kind of six, seven months. And then I was released. Mm. Um, I felt at the time like I wasn't given the opportunity to really build back up. Um, They took me in after training. It was really weird because I used to share lifts with a lad that lived in a little town that I lived in as well. And he just got a renewal and I got released. Oh. Probably within like a couple of weeks. So we're getting we're getting in the same lift back back home. Um what, completely what contrasting. Was, what was said? Not a lot. Just quiet. Not a lot. Yeah. I was a quiet kid and my friend was as well, actually. Um so not a lot was said, but the look said it all. Yeah. You know? I could tell that he wanted to 
say sorry mate and things like that but i was fuming mm. absolutely fuming and that was at 13 14 13 yeah. i got ill 14 i got released mm. Mm. i'm guessing you weren't still playing rugby at the time no i had to stop as soon as i started playing for first was eight. Oh, eight and it was a passion of mine i think this is something again we might get onto this later on from my time in america American kids grew up playing three, four sports. Yes. Mm. And then at 18, they have to really choose, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that's a real benefit because you learn different skills, different practices, and you're, all your eggs are not in one basket. Yeah, Identity is a big thing, right? Especially yeah. in football. Um, and they don't have that issue quite as heavy over there because you've got different avenues you can go down. Even to the point where you're 21, 22 and getting drafted, there's yeah. people like Russell yeah. Wilson, I think it's, that's Russell Wilson. Um, could have gone to the NFL or the M MLB. Yeah. Don't get that here. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, so released at 14. Um, and it just gave me the fire in my belly to so show them that they were wrong to the point where going to the gym every single day after school, before school, playing football at on a 14? Saturday. Yeah. Oh, playing yeah, football. You can't get a gym membership at 14. Oh, bro, you can get a 13. Gym, huh? Yeah, you can get yeah, it at 13. You just have to go in certain hours after school. I only started when I was like 15 or 16. Yeah, you're from Ireland though, isn't it? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you, had to, you had to go in in certain hours. So you couldn't okay. be in there past five o'clock, basically. Yeah, yeah. So from three, half three when you finish school till five, yeah, you can go in and use it. And then wow, playing fair enough. for a Saturday team, Sunday team, yeah. I was, I'm gonna show, gonna show them. And nothing was coming for like six, seven months, but I was determined. Yeah. And then, very randomly, the Saturday team that I was playing for, we played against Swindon Town in a friendly, mm. midweek friendly. And for some reason, someone in the Swindon team was being watched by United, by Man oh. United. Um, and I had a stormer. I'm 5'8 now, I was 5'6, but they put me at centre back and I smashed yeah. it. <laughs> for some reason, um, I just had one of the best games that I've probably mm. ever had in football. Two weeks later, I was invited to go up to United for a trial. Wow. So I'd gone from being released or being ill being released not really knowing if I'd really get back into football properly to United all in the space of two years mm. um, which was like an incredible part of the journey I'm very thankful for um, but other I guess ACs in, in childhood uh, I think going to going to a secondary school and people f know you as the footballer yeah. you're at an academy mm. especially at the little town that I was at there was maybe other two or three others in the whole school, secondary school of 1,200 people that were at academies. Um, so you're known as Sam the footballer, Harry the footballer. Yeah. But how did that actually affect you though? When, the, when I got the, released. In the day to day. When I got released, um, mm. it's a fall from grace, you know? Yeah. P people hold you on a pedestal, uh, you're, you're a footballer and the social hierarchy at most secondary schools, if you're a footballer, you're at the top, even oh, if you don't yeah, speak. Yeah. And I'm an introvert, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> how does that work? Yeah. They'd be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> just being quiet and then just be like, oh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's a footballer. Yeah, exactly. But, but then, give me, but, what are some examples of like situations where you're just like, well, if there's no need for that. Like, I remember like just different <laughs> situations where it's just like people just bring stuff up or yeah. they just banter it and they just mention it in some. What, is this when you've been released? No, or I mean, just, just in general from football. being, yeah, you play football for academy and stuff. Mm, yeah. No, what are some experiences that you guys have had? I, I would, I'd probably say growing up, um, you know, there's some people they couldn't care less about you, but they want the clout that they know you. Mm -hmm. So they would always mention the fact that, oh, my friend, yeah, he plays football for this. He scored this on the other day, um, and I think that's probably, yeah, probably one of of many many different examples of probably people using you, and you not even knowing. Um, that they're leveraging who you are and what you've done to make them feel big. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's a good point. Actually. I haven't no, thought no. about it like yeah. that. I think that happens a lot. I, I think I recognise that only when I was probably around 18, looking back on it, mm. um, when you're like, right, is this guy really my friend? Or mm, 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 <laughs> was he just bringing me here to bring clout to, yeah. to, to other, think, other areas? And think, I think yeah. if you're not very self-aware yeah. and you're very trusting, people can easily just use you and leave you 100%. you know because my question was to you was actually yeah, no, go on go on go on no I was just gonna build on that in terms of you have to be very careful as a footballer growing up especially if you're coming through academy like that yeah who you choose to be friends with who you allow into your circle and that because mm. a lot of people are just gonna be want to be your friends 
just because you play football and you have that potential. Hundred percent. Like, yeah. and you and you must have seen it over the years where you know growing up you're at Man United. These guys used to always comment on your posts and that. Now you're not there. They're not commenting on your mm. posts. You yeah. know what I'm they're not even liking. Yeah. Some of them are following you. It's a good point actually because when yeah. I. Oh. When, I f- when I first came back from, so I did pre-season with United, and when I first came back to Bristol, Instagram was first popping off, so I made a post about it, and then when you're not with United, the p- same people yeah. liking it, those types of things, it's a good point, I've never really thought about it like that. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's so interesting, because even going back to your journey, I was going to ask, who would you say you were then, in terms of your identity? Because I guess you lived in a couple of different places. Mm. You played a couple of different sports. You played for a couple of different teams, um, and you're still only <laughs> in your teens. Fourteen. You, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. How would you have defined who you were in terms of your identity? I was someone that was so ambitious and so wrapped up in football that everything else was blinkered. Mm. Um, to the point where, at the time, being released spurred me on but I didn't feel like it had spurred me on. It just felt normal to carry on going. Yeah. It's only looking back that mm. I took that and, it, and I, I tried to run with it. Yeah. I try to roll, trying to roll with the punches. Mm. My mum helped me a lot with that actually. She yeah. was, yeah, she was, when we get onto sports psychology, yeah. I didn't have access to a sports psychologist. Mm. My mum kind of filled those shoes as best as she could. Wow. Um, and she's helped me a lot with those kind of elements. She's an intelligent woman, very emotionally intelligent as well. Mm-hmm. And I think she noticed that there's a couple of paths I could go down. I did actually start to go down the wrong path to begin with. Yeah. Oh, really? Kicking off in school, those types of things. Isolation. Um, yeah. And to be fair, someone that I've thanked recently is the PE teacher that I had mm-hmm. when I was 14, put me on the straight and narrow as lo- along with my mum. He took me to one side and he's like, what are you doing? Like, mm. you've got you've got intelligence, you've got ambition, mm. football's not everything, mm. but you can still go down that path, stop throwing it away. And mm. that was what I was doing at the time. I was, I was reacting negatively. I was kicking off and throwing my toys out the pram because I wasn't at an academy anymore, which was not the wrong, right way to go about it. Mm. And that was what helped me to really step into gear. But yeah, looking back at the time, I think I was quite confused. Yeah. As a as a lad, because I think it's getting better now. Speaking with clubs, and now they've got yeah. player well well being, and they've got psychologists in the academy or the high level clubs anyway. Yeah, 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 I think the communication's getting better with players. That when I was there, it was you're going to make it. Essentially, yeah. to most of the players, it was you're going to make it, mm. and that's really dangerous to yeah. pl- to tell a player that. Especially when I look back and the lads that I was with at Bristol Rovers, only three played pro. Oh. Uh, the ones that came and came and went that had contracts three are currently still playing pro mm. so the amount of trial list that we had the amount of lads that were signed on probably in the hundreds for that one age group right um three of them have made it professional and pretty much all of us at one point were probably told this is the career for you mm. Mm. really really dangerous so i think at 14 i was confused and frustrated that i've been told this and it'd been taken away so, from so me. then what yeah. should they tell people at those ages in terms of at 11, 12, 13, 14, what should they tell young players? I think it depends on the player and the, and the person. Mm. First of all, different personality types, I think, will, will take to better communication or different yeah. communication. But I think it needs to be more, more about personal development, with football included, mm. Mm. but be, being a holistic, well-rounded holistic person. Yeah. Um, that applies themselves and gives the, the, all of themselves to football. I think that is a, a healthier way. Football is a pursuit. It's not who you are. Yeah, um, and speaking with yourselves, other people in football that are trying to make a difference and identity seems to be at the core of this. Um, I do think there's some really positive changes happening that are, that are needed. Mm. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's so good. So good because as I'm sitting here listening to you, I guess... Um, we we've all come through an academy system um and one of the big things maybe we don't address enough is the topic of early specialization and the need for that or is there a need for that you know because the system sets us up to say start early get in pre-academies nowadays six seven eight Mm. be in that system but that comes with side effects 
you know, not actually being able to explore your identity, not actually being able to be holistically developed mm-hmm. or even understand the need for that, you know. So I think to see the needle changing over time and clubs really embodying holistic development, even from a young age, I think it prevents some of the things that maybe we've gone through mm-hmm. as as young players. And I think it it's identity, like you said, um, football's what we do and it's not who we are. Um, but that topic of early specialisation is, so is one... It's mm. one we could probably sit here for, for ages because yeah. you want to get the reps in. Yeah. You don't want the reps to define who you are because there's never a, a pot of gold at the end of, of, of every rainbow. That's the truth. But when we just zoom out, though, with that, you can see that he played rugby alongside football in those early years. And I can no doubt think, and I'm looking from the outside perspective, that's definitely helped him in those journey, in that situation where he's obviously got release, etc. especially with the r- rugby culture which is quite different to football. But all these different experiences that you have from a young age, moving north to south, these are experiences outside of football that have mm-hmm. allowed you to now use those skills that you've developed in football. But I wanted to touch on what you said about, you know, the importance of having like teachers or mentors in your life to point you on the straight and narrow when you can't even think straight. You spoke about the fact that you were just so ambitious. You want to prove them wrong. You want to get back on track, all those different things. You didn't spend any time. It's what we mentioned last week on our on the questions podcast. Yeah. What do you say to a player who's just got released? And Toby, you know, he mentioned a great thing. He said, stop and look back. Look back at what you've already accomplished and achieved take some time out to heal mm. and not just put a bandage over it or not just take that injection that they ask you to take when you've got <laughs> an injury in, inject some what's it called um, anesthetics or something that's just going to mask the pain because mm. mm-hmm. that's what the ambition going to the gym all those different things you're acting mm. or you're not acting in a way that's going to help you move forward in the long term mm. So I was thinking, in terms of those teachers and those mentors, how imp- how important are they? It's a great question. Incredibly important, I think. Um, I think there's a two pronged approach to this, by the way, as well. When when someone gets released, I think starting off with better communication before someone's released about who they are and that holistic development. Mm-hmm as well as better communication when they are. I think that's a, a much better scenario than what has been there in the past. But with your teachers, mentors, um, sometimes they appear in life and maybe don't realize until after how much they've helped you yeah. in a certain situation. And sometimes you seek them out. That's very common for me now in business to, to seek out people that have been there, done it, um, and can, can help me along the way. Um, so sometimes it's a it's a proactive approach to find a mentor and a teacher other times sometimes you don't realise the impact they've had mm. until you look back and you think wow that piece of advice has really stuck with me um, but I do see certain football clubs that we've been working with or speaking with recently there's a, there's a mentorship programme and sometimes it's an official process other times mm. it's it's just part of their culture Um but the emphasis on it is definitely there at the moment. And I think that whether it be a footballer or a coach, a manager, a psychologist, someone that can help you to zoom out, zoom mm. out is probably a really good word, and realise where, where you are and potentially how to navigate the different options in the maze that you're going down, as well as look back. Um, I think it's really, really important. I think cost can be a barrier sometimes. <laughs> mm, um, yeah. Most men- mentorship uh, is free, mm. but uh, so as a mentor, you only have so much time to give for free, mm, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that, that there might be something that comes out. There's podcasts mm. like this that people can listen to that's incredible. Digital that wasn't mentors. there before. Exactly yeah. that. I, I don't come from a, a background of money. Um, and I, I say that because there's been times where I've wanted to speak to certain people. I come from a little town. There's not many people that are, that are entrepreneurs, that are footballers. I haven't been able to access those people. So mm. podcasts have actually been incredible. 
I can spend time with them without them spend time in, spending time mm, with me, you know? Um, I can learn from them. And in today's day and age, you can do that with the top 1% in the world and people that are on every st step of the journey in front of you and learn from them through stuff like this. So mentorships and, and teachers one-to-one, -one, incredible in a group setting, really, really useful. But if you can't access those because of time, cost, or just where you are in the world, stuff like this is absolutely invaluable to try mm. and try and grow and progress. Definitely. And you spoke about this ambition that you had to make it in football. That's what you were focused on at that time, at 14, getting that trial for United. But but where did that all begin? Why? What's the what's the why that, that drove you from a young age, you know, after quitting rugby to play for Bristol? And obviously after getting released and then at that 14 year old age I think it started with love like I loved playing just I could spend hours doing it I'd be on the field until my mum would call me home uh, most evenings even if I had training I'd go back and play afterwards so I think it started with love and then you realise I'm quite good at this people will tell you you know you, you've got a little bit about you um, and that com becomes addictive I think Mm. becoming uh, the best that I could be looking back I didn't think about it like this at the time as a, as a kid and as a teen but that progression and the validation of playing well um, was addictive mm. to the point where it was a bit of a cocktail for me where the validation was addictive but I was my own worst critic mm. so if I came off the pitch and I had a really good game someone would, would probably tell me or the coach my mum another parent whatever it might be my response was always, ah, oh, but I did this wrong, I did that <laughs> wrong. Mm. So I think for me, it was about next game, I wanted to not have as many of, ah, oh, I didn't do this right. So I think it starts off with the love. And then when you start to realize that you're good at it, the enjoyment increases, you want the validation more and more and more and more. And then maybe 12, 13, it starts getting serious at academies. You get more trialists coming in. It's dog eat dog. If Charles comes in, they're better than you. Then <laughs> you're, you're gone. See you later. Yeah. So I think it then becomes about survival as well, mm. uh, which at a young age I don't think is overly healthy. Um, but it's part of the game. I don't really know how we get rid of that as part of the game, because it is a um, it is it is, and the game is a results mm. business. And at twelve, it might not be that you're winning on a Saturday or a Sunday, but it might be that that person's playing better than you. They're giving better results. So you, as a result of that, you're losing your place in the team, you're losing your contract. So it goes from the love, the ambition to survival. And there's some weird cocktail mixed in of all those yeah. things um, that evolves over time. Yeah, that's, that's, that's so good. And I, I love how you mentioned love, ambition, survival. I, I guess at the point of setback, and when you got released what was going on there was there still the love of the game was there still that ambition or was it just simply survival mode I think it was survival and I think it was identity mm. as well like I was losing my identity and I think mm. looking back I was fighting so hard to keep that identity of being a footballer yeah. but also again I'll go back to my mum my mum told me to use it as fuel mm. um, and that fuel was taking me to try and become the best footballer I could mm. um, real blinkered really really yeah. really blinkered um, but I think it was in some ways I think it's good to have a pursuit yeah. that you're giving yourself to but this is that fine line that balance between mm. giving yourself to a pursuit and not getting your whole identity wrapped up in it Yeah, and no, yeah. I was even just off, a follow up off the back of that how do you find that balance you know as, especially as a as a young player, I've probably been in my twenties in that place of pursuit and not getting my identity caught up. And this is why we do what we do to have an identity beyond it, but mm. not have an identity not in it as well. You know. Um, so then, mm. how do you how do you find the balance? Because I'm probably seeing people more once they get released or leave. They're not really <laughs> they're done with football, mm. you know, and they lose the love for football and the ambition yeah. for football maybe because of different reasons but so how do you, how do you find that balance? maintain football before beyond football yeah mm. 
it's a, it's a deep question it's a hard yeah. question and i think the answer is psychologists mm. i think that you can you can get to that point over time through lived experience and from from self-reflection mm. but i think you can get there quicker guided by a psychologist mm. that can see what you're going through understands this like we understand it now yeah. right but i don't have the the tools or knowledge to help someone find that balance but a psychologist does yeah. but then the problem becomes access access yeah. access to a psychologist you know mm. um there's lads that i play with that are 27 28 now that are finding that balance now mm. um others found it at 16 17 naturally but that's that's a, an edge case it doesn't happen very mm, often yeah. for most people especially when they're ambitious on pursuing this and they enjoy football and in a deep level that's a balance that's really hard to come by. So. Yeah, that's, that's good. I wanted to go back to what you said about fighting so hard to keep that identity. <clears throat> it's quite, when I hear things like that, I'm just like, it's so deep Yeah. to consider the fact and the power, the weight of football and how much gold dust that it holds mm -hmm. in this world. Yeah. That people, and I've seen this so many times, people will fight to be attached in some sort of way mm. the the fan behavior the relig religio religiosity mm. to stay attached to their clubs players or staff wanting to work at a certain club just what what gives it so much power that you want to fight something that's broke your heart something that's caused trauma what makes it so good that you want to fight to maintain that identity? I'm speaking to my, I'm asking myself. <laughs> why, uh, someone asked goes, me, why are you still playing for? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what makes it so good? Like it's like a drug. Like it's yeah. just, I just, I think it's so deep. Mm. It's a really interesting one because I guess having that tension between your your, your question was phrased perfectly. How do you still maintain? Was it um, ambition in football before going? Mm. Um, how, uh, or how do you that pursue whilst how do you beyond football? Yeah, how do you maintain football before beyond football? Yeah, I don't think it's what we're doing; it's actually what it makes us feel for ourselves, and and it comes back always back to identity. But deeper than identity is worth. And I think we get a worth from playing mm. that we can't and we've never experienced on mm. any other level mm. when, when it comes to football. You know, like you said, you go into school at 12, 13, everyone pulled out the red carpet for you. They know you're the man. You know, where else are you going to get that in your life? Even when you go home, your parents aren't bringing out the confetti yeah. every time you step into the <laughs> house, are they? But if you play on a weekend, you've got thousands of people asking to sign, sign shirts, get pictures with you. I said, there's a, there's a sense of worth that you have which is attached to your football, mm. that if you let go of your football, you let go of your sense of worth. Mm. And until yeah. you find something which gives you that same level of validation, like mm. you said, you're never really going to be satisfied. You're going to only think of the former days. Oh, it was great when I used to play. Yeah. It was great when I, when I was at this club. It was great. Because what you're searching for is something to fill that void which football once was. Mm. And I think when you talk about switching over, I think people pack up football only when they find something which is a greater worth and a greater identity mm. than what they had before. And I've seen it with many different players where I'm like, oh, you've been chasing this the last two years. Yeah, but now I'm doing this. And I'm like, you seem like you're done with football. Yeah, because now I've got this, mm. you know? So, so it's actually a changing of, I guess, allegiance of your worth, you know, or attachment yeah. of your worth. You know, and actually attaching it to something else which gives you that same level of worth, same level of identity, same level of purpose. You know, so yeah, no, I think I think it's it could worth. be that still. It's all about worth. It's all about it's worth. worth. And I think that what people outside of football, even fans, won't be able to comprehend just purely because it's a feeling it's, it's not tangible unless you're there mm. is the dressing room culture mm. like going from being in an environment where you go in every day you have breakfast with your teammates or your, your best mates in in often yeah. circumstances 
you train together, you lift together. Yeah. Sometimes you actually might even live together, right? <laughs> yeah. And then you go on, you go into a game every Saturday, and you feel like you're going to war with your brothers. Mm. In that, in it's, if it's a good team environment, try try and take someone that has that for nine months of the year, yeah. and take that away from them as yeah. well as their self worth, isolate them as well, yeah. and identity. Yeah. Wow. That's also a huge part of it, right? Yeah. And I felt that when I came back from America, I went from playing and training with my mates my teammates every day although the last couple of months of it i was i was injured so mm. i was watching on but i came back from that and went into the world of work mm. and it's you go into an office it's not the same not the same. it's not this it's not the same and mm. that transitions hard and i was 19 so for other people that carry on until they're 30 35 mm. i can't even i can't even imagine that yeah. But I do think you're right. It, when when we touch on someone moving from football out of it, it's definitely easier if they find something. But I think a lot of the problem is when they don't have an option to leave football or mm. not. Yeah. If they're injured or they don't get another contract or whatever mm. it might be. But how can you find something when you don't have anything to give? takes time bro you've got to rebuild yourself yeah you've got to discover how can you find something when you don't have anything to help you find that thing you're in the dark and you have no torch mm. and you how can you find what you're looking for you ain't got the skills you ain't got the tools mm. <sighs> that's it's, I, you need someone else to you, to to, bring, to come to bring and bring that. But, but that's 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 a life. You can't. No man's an island. We we always used to say. You, mm. know? Um, you need people, and mm. I think that's what that's deep though. You, you get from being part of a sense of in a community, you know. And I think footballers seem like we're part of teams, mm. but the show still goes on if you're injured I said we're not going to play with 10 men I said if you get released I said they're probably going to bring someone else mm. the show goes on so as much as you're attached to that community and you love and you're benefiting from that community that community can leave you just like that Yeah. and if you don't attach yourself to another community then you become isolated and no man's an island so when you're isolated then you can't access what you need to continue bettering your life yeah. discovering who you are understanding your sense of worth away from the community of football and football as your identity and purpose. So it's it's a complete mix of, of many different things, but life goes on. And I think that's where the tools that we're probably looking to put in place just support people in their life. And football has been part of their life, but we want them to have a better life even when they finish playing. Mm. So, exactly that. Yeah. I think that we build we build amazing soft skills as team sport mm. players, right? Rugby, football, cricket, whatever it might be. Communication, social skills, you learn how to argue. Yeah, That's a, <laughs> it's an important thing. And as you grow up, you argue and then you forget about it because you need to be able to perform together. Yeah, And these are all really valuable skills in life, in business, whatever it might be. But when you get released or you get injured, mm. like you say, you don't have anything left to give. But that doesn't last forever. Like that's, mm. that feeling is not going to last forever. Um, yeah. And this is another area that psychology, psychology is so important, yeah. right? When we're, we're, everything that we're talking really about, important. like the mind is the operating system, yeah. right? It follows us everywhere we go. Yeah. Um, if someone can build the psychological skills, whether it be in football yeah. or any other area, it's going to do them well in life. It's going to help yeah. them. The way that I kind of look at it is, we've got equilibrium, right? Yeah. Which is kind of like this and the highs are here the lows are here and I'm, I know people and I know I can get really caught up in the highs I'm really caught up in the lows but when you learn these psychological skills the highs aren't quite as much of a crash and the lows don't last as long and they're not as much of a low mm. so we're gonna go through things in life but if we learn these skills and people can access them we're going to bounce back into mm. equilibrium a lot yeah. sooner and we'll be we'll be able to get on with life yeah it's exactly like you know, when you're feeling a niggle, I was feeling that cramp in my calf not too long ago. Tension in my muscle, etc. I know I need to ice bath. I know I need to take some electrolytes. Yeah, I know yeah. I need to, I've got the skills through my time in the academy system to know that, okay, once I start feeling this pain, mm. this damage, 
I need to do this, I need to foam roll, I need to stress, I need to take it easy a little bit. Yeah. That's the approach we need to do or to make the norm in terms of psychological skills, in terms of yeah. mental health well-being. But we can go on for on all for this. But <laughs> we're gonna get more into your story and your journey after that experience at Man United. You know, you spoke about going to America, but mm. just tell us how you got to the point of doing what you're doing now. Please. So from United until now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so I was told at United I wasn't gonna get a contract, mm. but I played a few games um, in the weeks before that for them. One was against Reading mm. um, and Reading had approached United after and said, if you don't take these few players on, we'd like to, we'd right. like them to come down. And I was one of them. Mm. Um, so this is 15 turning 16 scholarship time. So, I'm in Bristol, or living in Bristol, up in Manchester, back to Bristol, over to Reading, in digs in Reading for, I think about four or five weeks, playing for them, doing well actually. Um, and I did it, the most stupid mistake. I've got something that returns as a pattern in my life that I'm dealing with, it's overtraining or mm. um, burning out because oh, I'm doing yeah. too much. Yeah. Mm. I played for them against Everton on a Saturday and I'd been at Diggs all week so my mum came to watch or she drove all the way up from Bristol yeah. so they were like yeah go back with your mum spend the night and then come back on on Monday or Wednesday wherever it was and on the Sunday I played for my Sunday team oh. I got injured <laughs> so they were like look but scholarship time um I don't think they would have given me one, one anyway. I think it was like an easy decision out. It was a reason because <laughs> the straw yeah. that broke the camel's back. Um, but I wasn't offered one. And then um, whilst I was at United, a former coach of mine turned into a, an agent. Started sending me boots and stuff. I was at Reading. He organised the trial for me at Stoke. So then from Reading, I went up to Stoke, staying in digs. Um, and they didn't have the capacity to put me into the school that they were partnered with. So I was just at the training ground every day by myself and then everyone come in for day release what? in the afternoons yeah it was pretty crazy to be honest with you wow. going back to what, this at digs 15? at 15, 15 wow. going back to the digs she was a lovely woman and maybe like late 50s 60s it was just me and her yeah. so I'm moving up I'm trying to make it as a footballer yeah. there's not much for us to talk about she was very very welcoming she cooked for me and stuff like that it was great but I was so homesick yeah. so homesick and caught like just lonely, if anything. Mm. Um, and then the lads would come in. I remember my first day there, actually. Someone that you probably have come across as a, as a keeper, Carlo Nash, was taking our, our session trying to do his coaching badges. And after the session, I did really well. The head of academy pulled me in. He was like, are we gonna have to pay for you? Mm. Wanna offer you a contract? No, 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 I'm not signed on to anyone. And then I played two games for their 18s, the Wednesday and the Saturday. And on the Saturday, I had a, absolute shocker I was awful dragged me after uh, maybe like 30 40 minutes yeah. contract out the window uh, sent me what happened so I was playing CDM we were playing against Liverpool and I just got ran all over like, properly ran all over like physically they were bigger than me um, which is not enough of an excuse because I could find pockets I got the ball i will give it away and I think what I was experiencing was one mistake turned into two mm. and I was getting in my own head I was yeah. anxious about it and I was looking the at these big lads bearing down mm -hmm. on me um, and I bottled it yeah. I, I bottled it so two days later they bought me a ticket back to Bristol went back um, tail between my legs feeling like I'd let myself down to be honest with you because I felt like I was good enough to get a contract there um, and then I had the option at 16 I was signed a scholarship with Southampton. They were running a something called a second chance program. Lads that don't get a scholarship at other teams, you're not gonna be part of their core 18 scholar group, but you're gonna train alongside them, maybe train with them every now and again. They'll keep an eye on you. If you're good enough, they'll bring you in. It's the first time they were trialing it. I think they, they packed it in after three or four years. So I had that and I could do a BTEC in sports science, mm, I think it was, yeah. or sports coaching. At the same time, I saw these lads that were two, three years ahead of me either getting injured or getting no pro contract and they had nothing to fall back on. Sometimes falling into a life that I didn't want to live, a mm. like fast money type life, like yeah. stuff that you shouldn't be doing. Mm. So I took a decision at 16 to try and pursue to get a better education. 
but play football at the same time. And the only thing that was presenting itself was to try and get a scholarship at a private school. I come from no money. So I had no money to pay for anything like that. So I was quite lucky our county football manager was also a teacher at a private school. So I just approached him and said, I'd love to like, come and have a look. Yeah. And that snowballed into a trial, snowballed into a full scholarship. Yeah. Did two years there, got some A-levels behind me. Um, and then trained with Bristol Rovers during the, the winter breaks with their 18s. And then at 18, uh, went over to America yeah. for what turned out to be a year. Should have been four years. Got injured after 10 months out there. Um, osteitis pubis. And it was quite a serious bout of it. So what, hip what and pelvis. South Carolina. Um, mm. Culture shock. Really welcoming yeah. people. Yeah. They had know nothing about football. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Um, but it was it was nice, and it was good to get a look at how they treat sports mm. as part of their lifestyle. We went to watch a, a high school American football game. Do you ever do? Do you ever go and watch your local school? Like, it just doesn't <laughs> exist, does it? There's like six, seven thousand people there no. to watch a high school football game. We used to get a good crowd as well. Um, but it was a good experience, really good experience. Injured, came back, went into the world of work first of all with the ministry of defense and i was thinking wow like national security working on really cool projects this could be good mm. uh my first week there my manager told me she was going off on maternity leave and they had no other managers for me so for the first five six months i had no work and i went into it with full ambition trying to attack it like i did with football mm. and i just felt like wow i felt really let down in some ways although it wasn't really anyone's fault I felt like i had all this ambition want to learn and here we go back to mentors right mm. um but no one to really tell me okay we'll go do this or mm. give me some work to do um so after 18 months of pushing through there i then went into trying something that was completely different i wanted something fast paced competitive that re would remind me of football in some ways mm. so i went into sales um and eventually over a couple of years worked out that i wanted to do technology and startups and really started to get interested in innovation and building mm. stuff that solves a problem. Um, Sounding it was, it was the, it was a process over time. And I think that when I speak to lads that come out of academies or football now, they want to find the right thing straight away. Yeah. And they look at me doing what I'm doing now and they think that I found this straight, straight away. away yeah. But it's been a journey over the last seven mm. years to find, to find the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, and timing's everything, right? Timing's yeah. everything. Um, but it's ta it's been a journey to go yeah. through that. And I'm glad that I did because it's taught me life lessons, yeah. soft skills, hard skills, and everything in between, as well as failing a lot. Yeah. Um, that's stood me in good stead for where I am now. And I think football's also stood me in good stead because as a startup, you get things wrong. Mm. You hear no a lot. Um, even though people really believe in you or what you're doing, you're going to hear no's. You're going to hear, don't think it's quite right for me. Don't think the timing's quite right. And I think that being in football and being rejected at, 30, at 14, 15, a few times, mm -hmm. that's stood me in such good stead to be able to deal with the knockbacks now and just keep going. Just keep mm -hmm. going. Um, so, yeah, that was the journey. That's so good. Yeah, so good. Amazing. I think there's a... There's a quote we l we love to say. It. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Is that a quote? No, it's no, a quote. No, to... it's not. I told him a long time to... ago, but it's um. We need to. It's uh, Mate, Someone it's told actually... you, isn't it? No, who told yeah, you? Never told forget. me who told yeah. you. There's a, quote. there's a quote. It says, um, "You learn who you are in practice and not in theory." You know, mm. um, and actually really stepping out and learning about yourself as you go, um, because I guess people see the end product oftentimes. Mm -hmm. like, I've just met you today. I don't know much about your journey or story or the, the lows and the highs that you've gone through. So people are like, rah, I should be where you are. You know, and there's a lot of comparison oftentimes and people don't see the hard yardage. And I think that's one of the things that we want to really get across that start early, you know, start to discover what you want to do early mm -hmm. um, because it takes time. Um, nothing's just a, a microwave meal. You can just put it in and it's just going to happen tomorrow unless someone just gives you something and gives yeah, but, you something, but, but it's very, if, very rare. Even if someone gives you it, it's not going to last. maintain it, yeah. But that's why it's like what you said, those experiences you went through really put you in good stead. 
I'm trying to see, I'm under the impression that we need to make younger players or younger people go through tougher this tougher situations. Mm-hmm. Cause I'm 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 I believe that yeah, hard times are good. I th- I think it's it's not just hard times. It's ultimately it's the lessons. Do you know what I'm saying? If you could take the lessons out without the experience, yeah, you but you can't. The... You can't do that though. You can't. You can't cheat. You can't cheat the game. You have to go through it. But there's ways of teaching certain things. You know, the think... one thing. I, one thing I learned from the podcast I listened today, Dario Vecio, Stephen Bartlett, and Doctor Orion, starting something with T. He's a dating doctor, but he said that insight alone is not enough. Giving people an insight into your journey, into what they should do, all of these things, it's not enough. There's pe- he said, there's people out there that know all the addictions, that know all the um, risk factors, that know all good. all these different things, mm. but they're still addicted. Mm. Having the yeah. insight and the knowledge is not enough to push and invoke action. People need to go through it. How do you replicate going through it? In football, I think there's some really s- small ways to teach you lessons. Like, if you're like in America, our coach did this so often and it infuriated me because I didn't realize what he was doing. But mm-hmm. after now looking back, I get it. He would give bad decisions in training, purposely yeah. give bad decisions so that he would basically coach us and ingrain it in our mind. If someone gives a bad decision, you just get on with it. Oh, like if if someone gives a pass away or the referee gives a bad decision, whatever it might be, you deal with it, you get on with it. And it was mm. a really small way to introduce re- that replicating to Replicating the environment. Yeah. Exactly that. I think yeah. there's gentle ways gentle. or yeah. there's ways to there's ways to go towards particular lessons to without that. the big yeah. emotional. It's similar experience. to visualization, right? Yeah. Mm. Imagery, um virtual reality. But that's still a process of going through it. Yeah. But when you use the word tough, you have to go through tough things. It doesn't things. always have to be tough, I don't think. I think I, I think, I think, create I think an it has to be. which actually helps people. When I say when I say tough, I'm not saying I'm saying tough in the way that it makes you exert amount of energy more than your normal state. Putting I'm okay, let I, me let me rephrase it. Not tough per se, but out of your comfort zone, yeah. Ch- challenge, challenge, challenge yes. Where you got to rise to the challenge and tough and challenge. Are the same I thing disagree. Though. If you don't if, think if so. someone just said, "Oh, you got to go through tough times," you have to though. But they're challenging. Thinking, that's, I that's think like challenging is even that's like completely when you, negative. When someone says you're tough, compared to someone saying you're challenging, challenging it's nuanced, stands. It's nuanced. Fair enough. It's just, it's just the word. But it's, it's interesting. But it's, mm, let's let's yeah. see. Let's hear about. How did you get to the point of building what you're building today? And also, what is the main mission that you guys want to accomplish and impact you want to have on the world? There, there was a, there were several things that happened over a couple of years that made me want to make a, a difference. I'm feeling like the technology is there or can be developed to do so. Um, so like conversations with people that I've grown up with, I was quite lucky at the private school that they had multiple different high level sports. So Olympians that have gone to Paris Olympics, rugby players, cricket players, etc. Um, so a lot of my friends are in different sports other than football. Speaking to them, the ones that are at the highest level have access to a psychologist, the ones that aren't don't. And there's stark differences in how they would approach a difficult situation the first one being I'll go to my psychologist <laughs> if I can access it right yeah. um, so that was the first indicator as well as as I grew up my mum gave me books around uh, positive mindset and these types of things and they made a massive impact on me mm. but I never had access to a, a psychologist that I know looking back would have been helpful and at the time um, we did look into it at, at certain points especially when I was coming back from illness but over the last couple of years, yeah, speaking to people that do and don't have access and seeing the impact or the void that it leaves if you don't have access, mm. um, it started to become apparent that if an individual doesn't, 
what impact does that have on how they think, feel and perform? Um, and if you're in a high pressure environment like football, that impact goes into your contract and your career. Mm. So it's really anxiety uh, inducing. And also we've touched on identity today. So it's all ingrained in that. So I wanted to help, essentially. I knew they would have helped me growing up, but more focused on helping other people, um, especially if there's anyone that goes through the released process or the academy process or illness, injuries, all, all the above. Mm. Um, those are moments where it becomes really apparent, but also for the day to day, like, it's not just the negatives with psychology, it's also the positives and the average. Mm. Like, it impacts how we learn, communicate, focus, perform, and how product productive we are. So it's twofold, really. It's how can we minimize the negatives or help the negatives, and how can we maximize the positives? Mm. And what I looked to and what the, the people in my network would say that they're using was books and podcasts. And I think they're an amazing entry point but they're not personalized and they're not continual for that individual it's not based on their psychological profile and we when we look at technologies like whoop um or even hr uh, heart rate technologies now right they're personalized to that individual it builds out a profile and understanding and that person can develop based on the the data and the tools so i was like why can't someone do this with psychology the mind is the operating system it follows them everywhere it dictates how they perform how they think feel so surely someone must be doing something. And when I looked out, there's really, there's people trying to make a difference. I feel like technology can make a bigger difference at scale. And we're coming to, into an age now where AI is a huge buzzword and it can be quite scary for people. The way that I think we prefer to look at it as to what we're developing is more informed intelligence. It's not mm. artificial, it's fed by seasoned professional I, I. sports psychologists. <laughs> I, I. Right? So, wow. Okay, that's good. For us, the, the mission is the mission is to help people access what isn't currently accessible. Starting out with performance psychology, it's only really accessible to the top top leagues and performers in sports or the highest earners, which leaves the ninety five ninety percent of athletes they don't have access to that. And we want to help them first of all. Mm. But imagine a world where each person can access these tools and they just get 1% better in each area, especially when it comes to the mind. What impact does that have on how they think and how they perform when they go out on a Saturday or a Wednesday, whatever it might be, whatever their sport is. So for us, the, the mission is to help people. Mm. It's to help them build the psychological self-awareness, understanding self-improvement and performance improvement um, in a way that currently isn't accessible. It's it's kept it's gate kept mm -hmm. and i think that technology can really help us unlock that gatekeeping yeah. um so it's a bit political then in what way in terms of gate <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, no let's not do that and uh, in terms of um the power power yeah 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 but um mm. sorry let me not interrupt you no you what was the question no i was saying it's political in terms of it stops prevents it makes the higher ups I am um, succeed more and the people who have lack of access they stay at the same level potentially yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. they're like sports is, sports like a pyramid right mm. the highest level at the top of the pyramid are the highest earners and then they're the fewest in numbers yeah. and you go down to semi-professional yeah, yeah. amateur hobbyist that's the bit that's the base of the pyramid yeah, it's yeah. really wide right yeah and but then access to performance psychology is an inverted pyramid. All of the access is kept at the top. That's where the wide base is for the smallest amount of people. Yeah. As you go down, access decreases. Yeah. And what we hope to do is to turn that on its head. It's great. It's great imagery. I guess it's it's like what you mentioned before. I was speaking to a player yesterday. He was talking about he used to use a psychologist, but what he was paying monthly was just way too expensive. So he couldn't keep it up. So it's actually it's not that it's not out there it's just can we is it accessible enough to the masses to mm. make a massive difference and, and i think what you're doing is is, is amazing yeah. to be honest it's so important it's you about know, delivery now right yeah. it's about <laughs> it. making sure that the value is, is there like we can talk about it of course it can be unless we actually deliver we're just street preachers yeah yeah that's the main issue with psychology now because there's a lot of apps that are trying to do similar things because you can't quantify it you said something clear and clean you can't quantify how you're feeling in that moment. You can't quantify that change room environment and the value. So now we're all about quantifying it so that we can show the value. 
So I think that's why Ebb is at the forefront. And, you know, we at Beyond Football, we're, we're really for it, man. It's needed. You know, we need to make that accessible so every player is able to deal with that setback. Me as a young player, I couldn't deal with mistakes. If I made a mistake, conceded a goal, my whole session is ruined. I make a bad pass, my mm -hmm. whole session. So it has a massive effect. So these are some of the the things in the background and the little gems and insights that people need to make aware of. So, 100%. Yeah. I wanted to f finish off by asking you a few questions in terms of how your experience in football has helped you run that startup. You've got a valuation of six, seven, eight figures. How has football influenced that? But also, uh, what are some of your experiences like, in that and world? Your like, best experiences in that world, like at running a startup? Wow. Um... I think what's helped me is the resilience that you get built, the relationships that you can build with different people from different backgrounds. Starting at Bristol Rovers, I was with people that were from all sorts of different backgrounds, different heritage, different ethnicities that I wouldn't have experienced in the little town that I grew up in. Um, and football is full of different characters. Mm. Uh, and that's really set me up to be able to understand people, empathize with them. Mm. Um, but I think the biggest thing is probably the resilience. Mm. Like Every no for us is just one step closer as opposed to something that defines our day or our month. And I speak to other startup founders that haven't had the luxury of being told no mm. when they were younger. Mm. Whereas I have mm. on a few occasions and at the time it stings, it really hurts. <laughs> but I'm glad that it happened now. Mm. Um, I think the best things that we've experienced so far, sometimes I speak to people that are advising us or want to play a part in us in some way and they're my childhood heroes. <laughs> so first wow. of all, like, it's very surreal, yeah. like very <laughs> surreal. Um, but I think it speaks to people who are passionate about what we're doing and it's needed. Um, along the way, there's been loads of different milestones, but each one What's has the been... the biggest one? I think looking back over the last month we've now got a team of people that first of all you don't build a startup team um without people really believing in the mission because we haven't got enough money to pay them right now mm. and not pay them what they're truly worth mm. each person's being paid um so for us we've got a team of people from all walks of different all different walks of life we've got a developer that's french another one that's italian We've got a product manager that's based in Birmingham, two psychologists based in London, but one's from Australia. We've got the ex-chief medical officer from Headspace that's part of this. We've got Matt Jarvis from West Ham in England. Yeah. All of these individuals are bought into the idea and helping people and trying to execute. Mm. And I think the best moment is looking back and going, this idea was in my head. That th What we're doing right now, yeah. it, yeah. it was in wow. my head. And now we have a team of people that are passionate yeah. about solving this um so i think that's the best moment so far that's as well as that's the, inspiring our man. prototype that's inspiring, help people man. you know right mm. yeah so then at this I mean, current point in time who are you beyond football i am um, my head first of all goes to i'm a i'm a brother i'm a son i'm someone that's very passionate about learning and helping others and learning about myself and self-development and i think that what i've learned over the last few years is that as long as I'm part of a pursuit of helping people and I'm growing with it, mm. I'm, I feel like I have a purpose in my life. Um, and I think that beyond football, I don't know if I'd have actually got that within football, to be honest with you. Wow, um, that's deep. So it's been, a, it's been a proper journey, to be honest with you. Mm. And you, you guys probably know, the journey always goes with you, especially if you mm. go home after a few years and you're still that person, the footballer, mm. you have to revisit it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think it's one that a lot of people go on and stuff like this is super useful for them to hear and feel like they're not alone. Yeah, yeah that's good. Wow, it's been amazing, man. Yes, man. So many gems. You know, we spoke about the mind being the operating system, your social skills and how athletic identity in the school is so crazy. But thank you so much for coming on, man. It's been it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me, so, It's been top, man. Make sure you guys check out Ebb. Be ready for when it launches. It's going to be in the link in the description. And make sure you guys 
listen to some exclusive snippet on Spotify. It's going to be there. Check out our website, beyondfootball.uk. Till next time. Who are you, Beyond Football? Thank you.